Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host this week and every week, and I'm a filmmaker and writer by trade, and I've been working with CCF now for, I think, 11 years, maybe 12, going on 12 years, uh, creating in that span of time so many videos I couldn't even begin to count, all kinds of video content, live video series like the one you're going to watch today, patient-centric documentaries, treatment-based videos, conference and event videos, hundreds, maybe more uh, videos, but all with the same singular mission in mind, and that is to spread awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do. Now, this show in particular is the, the value is twofold as I see it. One, the information that you're going to get from our guest today, and two, the shared stories and shared experiences from the community. I cannot tell you and, and emphasize enough how strong and supportive this net community is. So if you are new to this community and new to the show, I want to say welcome and introduce yourself in the comment section. As you see everyone else already, uh, the regulars to the show are chiming in and telling us where they're signing on from uh, across the world. So we have Canada in the house, Chicago land, just got back from Chicago doing a net patient story, actually. California always heavy. Yeah, reach out to people, say hello, introduce yourself. I promise you they will embrace you and that will be a very supportive and fulfilling part uh, of this journey for you. Before we get started, we always want to thank our sponsors, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals, because without their support, we wouldn't be able to do the show. And we also have this disclaimer from them, and that is that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters today, as well as the questions uh, asked by you all, the audience, haven't been created or suggested ahead of times by the sponsor uh, sponsors of Lunch with the Experts. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information expressed today uh, by the guests. So audience members should not rely solely on the guide on the opinions or information expressed by the guests and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices that they make uh, uh, about their health or treatment. So that last line is really the takeaway. We don't know your specific case. So we're going to give you some good answers to your questions and general advice. Take that advice and those answers back to your home team, which does make the best plan and path forward for you. Each case of this disease is unique. That is one thing I have learned over the past 10 years. And, and so therefore each plan and path forward is as well. Uh, today, I'm excited to welcome back to the show, Dr. Danang Lee. How are you, Dr. Lee? Good, Ray. Uh, always a pleasure to you know join your uh, session here. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you back. For those that might have missed you the first go around, which I think was about a year ago now, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do, where you work, and, and the role that you play in this or, or that you fill in this net community. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I'm a GI medical oncologist uh, here at City of Hope in Los Angeles, California. Um, so I, I lead our uh, liver tumor program and also co-direct the uh, neuroendocrine tumor program. Um, so as you mentioned before, like I, I think what has always fascinated me about neuroendocrine tumors is that, um, you know, it's uh, uh, unmet need and everything and right. uh, any progress that we can certainly make, I think, you know, goes uh, really beyond to uh, impact the lives of uh, patients that have this uh, diagnosis. When did the NET uh, tumor program, when was it established at City of Hope? Do you remember or no? Yeah. So, you know, I, I was partly recruited to, you know, kind of build on that program. So, so. the City of Hope about, uh, you know, almost seven years ago. Um, and uh, we've uh, really been able to grow the program and everything and really uh, hopefully have been able to make a positive impact uh, for not only our local community, but, uh, you know, all across the U.S. as well. What are the pieces or who are the pieces that really make uh, those programs work work well in terms of, you know, net net specifically? Yeah, so I, I think one of the um, uh, best things when I came uh, to uh, join City of Hope and to build the program was that I, I really had excellent partnerships with mm -hmm. my surgery colleagues, as well as interventional radiologists, um, you know, uh, I, I think oftentimes as a medical oncologist, we don't hear this enough, uh, but I, I certainly say that, you know, surgery is still the cornerstone uh, oftentimes of this disease and everything. And, uh, you know, based off of kind of that collaborative work with my surgery colleagues, as well as interventional radiologists, we were really able to establish uh, kind of that multidisciplinary team from the get-go to really build that program. And I think we were very unique in the sense that um, we were very aligned to build the program. So what we did uh, that was very interesting was that 
we made sure that we had clinic at the same time mm. uh, in the sense that one of our surgeons, myself, uh, as well as uh, interventional radiologists would have, uh, you know, made the effort to have, you know, clinic on the same day for, for example, on Monday, so that when a patient comes in, they're actually having three doctors seeing their films right away so that we can really, uh, you know, even outside of a tumor board, immediately plan for their management, you know, very quickly. Got it. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that, folks. Uh, I see a lot of us joining. We're working our way up to to 100 people, which is I always love to see. Uh, so here's the deal for today. A little bit of housekeeping before we fully get started. Go ahead and start sending in your questions. But I have a few tips that are going to help you uh, formulate your questions in a way that will help me get them answered for you. Right. So we're, we're trying to help each other out here. Um, as I mentioned at the very top of the program, we don't know your specific case and we can't really field uh, questions that are super dense or super case specific, I, I should say. Uh, so the best way for you to formulate those questions are, are in general terms, right? And also uh, short little chunks, right? I'm, I know you have lots of questions. I want to get to them all. We, we try to get to them all every week, but that's why we have the show coming back every week so that if we don't, We'll hopefully get you those answers eventually. But if you ask them in little chunks, like ask one and we can answer that, you could always ask more questions as you go along. Or if they spawn another question in your head, you have a follow up question, please send them along. But to, to kind of have a brain dump and you put all your information out there doesn't necessarily help us. It's just too much. It's too case specific and it is actually like hard to read. So that's really helpful for me. And of course, I'm just trying to get the questions uh, uh answer for you. And if you do have a follow-up question and if it's attached or related to your previous question, just give me a little bit of context, say, uh, you know, and, you know, referring to my previous question about dot, 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 and then ask the second question so I can make sure to put those two together. And uh, if here's another thing that I ask you to do every week, you all do a great job of this. If you see a question in this comment section that you also have, or you're interested in the answer to just under it, you can like that question. And what that does is effectively it upvotes it for me. So if I see eight people have liked that question or they, you know, that tells me that implies that that eight people are interested in the answer to that. Therefore, it's going to kind of upvote it. I'm going to see, hey, in that one question, we're going to help eight to 10 people. I'm going to make sure I get that one across because inevitably we get so many we can't answer them. So I encourage you to do two things if that happens. Reach out to CCF after the show if you still have questions or if we didn't get, get to your question. Reach out to CCF either at carsonoid.org, their website, or here on the Facebook page. And also, I mentioned at the beginning of the program, all the videos that I've shot for CCF over the years, that database is for you. It's free. It's on YouTube. It's also here under the videos tab. We have have two years, so uh, uh, over 100 Luncheon with the Experts, but also all the documentaries and treatment-based videos that I mentioned too. So use these resources. We are here for you, and we're here every week with the show. So if we don't get to it, uh, I encourage you to, to come back and try to get those questions answered. Uh, so go ahead and start sending them in, and let's have a chat today. Uh, first question comes from Eileen. Uh, I have no carcinoid syndrome symptoms. I have net tumors in, in both lungs and the chest lymph nodes. My doctor is recommending surveillance only to only until I develop symptoms, even though she says I am stage four. Is this normal? Yeah, so I, I think that's a really good question. Uh, you know, I think it depends on kind of a couple of different uh, caveats. Okay. Um, I think first of all, uh, just like... Uh, what we talked about, you know, every case of neuroendocrine tumors is uh, unique uh, individually. Uh, but, you know, generally one of the first steps is to really um, uh, look at the biopsy results from the diagnosis uh, to, to figure out, you know, is this a uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor of the lung? And if it is, um, what is the uh, grading of the tumor? Is, is it a grade one uh, tumor or is it a, a grade two tumor? Basically, um, uh, having an a, a analysis of kind of how fast the cells are dividing underneath the microscope. Uh, because this is really important uh, in the sense that if it's a grade two tumor, uh, then probably you should you know, potentially initiate treatment uh, in, in the very beginning. Whereas if it's a grade one tumor, then uh, possibly observation uh, and active surveillance may be uh, considered. Um, so once you have kind of that first step, the, the, the next step is uh, to decide, you know, what is the overall volume of disease? Mm -hmm. Is the volume of disease, you know, relatively very small, where it's unlikely to cause significant symptoms? So what is the size of the lesions in the lungs? How likely are they going to cause obstructive symptoms like shortness of breath if it grows by a certain amount? 
of um, uh, you know, centimeters or millimeters over time. Uh, so that's, that's really important and helps to make the decision. And then I think the final thing is, um, you know, are the tumors uh, somastatin receptor positive? Mm -hmm. um, we know that, uh, you know, the lung neuroendocrine tumors that tend to be somastatin receptor positive uh, tend to be potentially a little bit more indolent where observation can be considered. Uh, but a lot of times, um, you know, lung neuroendocrine tumors might not be uh, somastatin receptor positive. Uh, and again, you'll have to gauge this with the first uh, two caveats that I, uh, you know, listed. And, and together, based off of this decision, that really helps you to make the decision of active surveillance versus whether or not you should be on treatment in the very beginning. Got it. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, hopefully that helped. And, and, and again, if you have a follow-up question or any other questions, please let us know. Uh, next question from Christy. How does an MRI with Eovist, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Eovist contrast compare to gallium dota tape? Yeah, so I, I think that that's a really good question. And, uh, you know, we, we actually did, you know, some research uh, on this. So uh, MRI uh, in terms of with uh, Eovist, I would say is a really good anatomic um, uh, imaging modality to measure the size of tumors, particularly tumors in the liver. Uh, because oftentimes on standard CT uh, scans, the uh, lesions in the liver can be missed. Now, with a gallium 68 uh, dotate PET scan, um, sometimes you can pick up you know, very small tumors. Um, but what, when we look back in our kind of institution and actually compare the two head to head for specifically liver metastasis, uh, what we found is that for the really small tumors, uh, the uh, MRI with EOVIS scan actually was even more sensitive uh, than, than the gallium scan, which was a little bit surprising uh, you know, to us. And I think that does sometimes make sense because if you have very tiny tumors that are scattered throughout the liver, um, due to kind of the background noise of the gallium scan in, in terms of general basic liver uptake, you might miss some of those lesions, whereas the MRI EOVIS might be able to capture this. I think at the end of the day, though, you will want to have both of those scans. You'll want to have okay. the MRI with EOVIS as a way to measure the lesions over time in, in, in what we call uh, what's known as anatomic imaging. And then you will also want to have the gallium 68 dotate uh, to have an initial sense of whether or not all the disease uniformly uh, express somatostatin receptors, uh, because then that will help you make your treatment decisions. So really a gallium scan to determine somatostatin receptor activity and an MRI with EOVIS to follow over time as anatomic imaging to assess for true changes in size. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks for your question. Uh, and folks, if you get value from any of those questions, one way you can show us that visually is uh, right at the bottom of uh, of the screen. There's a, a, a lot of uh, thumbs up hearts uh, emojis em that you can use that Facebook gives you. Yeah, I see them coming in now. So yeah, if you get good answers, that's a good way to let us know that we're doing our job. Uh, really quickly, shout out to Corey and Louise, who are both currently getting uh, PRT treatment while watching the show. So sending you both love, light, and strength. Uh, next question comes from Beth. I am 69 years old and was diagnosed with mid-gut tumors in 2007. Uh, my brother, who's 73, was tentatively diagnosed with mid-gut last week. He is pursuing an accurate diagnosis at a neuroendocrine neuro, neuro uh, clinic. And the question is, how common or rare are carcinoid uh, tumors in siblings? I know this is a question that we, we often get or similar versions of this question. I think overall, it's still relatively rare, um, but, you know, we, we have started to see some of this, you know, cases and anything. And I think uh, it is definitely an area of research that we have to look into because so far, um, as many of you know, uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, oftentimes a clear cause of why someone develops uh, neuroendocrine uh, tumors. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think this is something that uh, does need to be uh, explored. Uh, we have actually started to, you know, kind of look at this in, in terms of um, uh, looking at particular hotspots throughout California and everything, and whether or not there's, you know, some type of environmental relationship or right. exposures and everything. Hope to, you know, share some of that data, you know, soon and everything. But I, I think uh, this is something that we are starting to actually see a little bit more frequently than we would anticipate. 
uh, in the clinic. So I, I think certainly it's real uh, and we just have to figure out, you know, potentially what is going on. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Uh, next question from Kaylin from Tewksbury, Mass. Uh, Kaylin, I think this is the first time I've seen your name. So if you're new to the show, I want to say welcome. Thanks for your question. Uh, she says, if something lit up on a post-op gallium pet that was not seen on a pre-op gallium pet, what would the next steps be? MRI, CT, this was an, uh, this was an area that was not near or close to the primary site. Yeah, so I, I think that that's a good question. So uh, a lot of times when it you know, lights up on a gallium scan. Uh, obviously, there is some anxiety of whether or not it's related to the neuroendocrine tumor. I think uh, first off is to, you know, ha have a detailed review with your team to make sure that it's not necessarily in a spot or area where you can potentially have false positives. Um, you know, we, we, we've seen that like a lot of times if it's kind of the head of the pancreas or other regions uh, that there are known kind of false positives with the uh, gallium scan to uh, uh, evaluate that. Um, if it's not really uh, in that, in those kind of typical areas and it, it's in an area that, uh, you know, is potentially suspicious, uh, then I agree, uh, you know, uh, one would be to get, you know, additional anatomic imaging. Well, let's say if it's in the liver to potentially get an MRI with an EOVIS uh, scan, if it's in the chest uh, to, to get, uh, you know, a high quality CT, uh, you know, contrast uh, of the chest. Um, and then depending on the size of the lesion, uh, then the decision is, you know, whether or not you can biopsy it, right? I, I think the challenge is that sometimes if it's really, really small on a gallium scan that you can't actually even see it on anatomic uh, imaging, then you can't biopsy it. And I would say in, in those cases, you should still, you know, follow with, you know, surveillance over time so that you're being followed uh, you know, fairly early so that you can see anything that does develop over time. So usually I, I like to do anatomic imaging scans actually every three months in that case scenario uh, to both, you know, help the patient uh, and um, uh, for us to be, you know, very active in that sense of active surveillance. Got it. Hey, thanks, Kalen. Next question from Michael and a few others. Uh, is 65% liver involvement uh, of net metastases a death sentence? Land reattied for the last year, but now it's not working. So our next move seems to be bland embolization. Thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, liver metastasis is uh, definitely one of the most common sites of disease from neuroendocrine tumors. Um, but it again depends on ultimately the biology of the neuroendocrine tumor. You, mm -hmm. you have, you know, very fast-growing neuroendocrine tumors or relatively slow-growing neuroendocrine tumors, and sometimes even at initial diagnosis for the very slow-growing neuroendocrine tumors, patients might not actually have any symptoms. And for those patients, even when they have significant tumor bulk in the liver, we can actually do a lot of things like what you're saying in terms of um, uh, liver directed therapy to further uh, shrink the tumor burden within the liver. I think as long as your liver function overall is doing okay, mm -hmm. uh, it is certainly not a, a, a death sentence. It, it needs to be monitored. It needs to be actively treated and everything, but it's not a death sentence. Where patients get into trouble is that if they have, let's say, a rapidly growing neuroendocrine tumor and the growth that's occurring within the liver is close to what, what we call something that's called the uh, portal outflow tract, which is, uh, you know, kind of a, um, a set of veins that essentially drain into your liver. Well, if you, as you can imagine, if you have significant blockage uh, in those tumors in that area, you essentially cause congestion into those veins and everything. And when that congestion occurs, you have widespread liver derangements. And that's when we get into trouble. Uh, so, so in a lot of times in um, our review of cases, we want to be aggressive on those tumors that might be close to this, you know, portal outflow and everything and aggressively treat those areas to potentially prevent long-term complications from um, uh, liver impactment. Got it. Thank you. Uh, hopefully that helps, Michael. Appreciate your questions and you love my friend. Folks, if you are just joining us or joining us a little bit late, this is Lunch with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program. It's today we are here with Dr. Denang Lee from City of Hope. 
in the city of angels over there on the left coast. Uh, great questions so far. Keep sending them in and do me a favor. If there's someone else um, that you think should be here or maybe forgot about the show, you can tag them in the comments or you can share this video to their page. Let them know and remind them the show is going on. Let's get as many people here as possible. Uh, but just a reminder also that once the show is done, it will be posted and be and live evergreen and it'll be permanent on the Facebook page just under the videos tab. And then starting Monday, we will republish to YouTube for anyone who doesn't have Facebook who wants to watch the replay. So you can always come back to it uh, and watch it after the show is done. If, if there's something that um, that you missed or something you want to revisit, just to let you know. Uh, next question from Kaylin. Uh, best treatment or therapy for post-op tumor removal where you're NED, no evidence of disease. However, there are small plaque areas left that tested positive for nets in the same area where the primary tumors slash nodes were removed. Do you follow all that? Oh, I, I guess I, can, I'll, I will try my best to, you know, I can go back. If, if, if everything. No, no, I, I, I think that, the, the the question that I have is you know potentially you know what what are these plaque like areas yeah exactly. um, uh, um, because usually that's not a a fairly common description that we hear hear about and everything. what does that what does that um, mean well I I actually don't know you know yeah, exactly okay. what it means because usually what I, I think you know how to guide you on this question is really you know go back to the pathology report and look at the pathology report. Um, so the, the pathology report will show a couple of different things. Okay. They'll show, you know, where the primary was removed, what is the size of the lesion, whether or not it's well differentiated uh, or poorly differentiated, and then it should show kind of the uh, grading of the tumor. In addition, it'll tell you the number of lymph nodes that were potentially resected mm -hmm. around the site of the primary and whether or not any of those lymph nodes were positive uh, for disease or not. And then I think the final thing that it, it will show that you might be uh, alluding to is whether or not the surgical margins were positive or not and everything. Uh, so what surgical margins might mean is that um, when a surgeon take the cut of the neuroendocrine tumor, uh, is the edge of the tumor where they cut, is it still positive for neuroendocrine tumor? You essentially want what's known as a clear surgical margin or a negative margin meaning that where they cut in terms of the edge of where they cut out the tumor, that that's no longer positive or it's, you know, uh, not positive uh, based off of a number of uh, millimeters to, you know, centimeter away from where, that, where it is. So that's essentially kind of a clear, uh, you know, what's known as margin negative surgical resection. Um, so in margin negative surgical resection for most neuroendocrine tumors, we don't necessarily have an established role for postoperative treatment. Uh, meaning that we don't know whether or not post-operative treatment will decrease the risk of recurrence uh, mm -hmm. or the disease ever coming back and everything. And there's currently an ongoing clinical trial looking at that for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors uh, throughout the entire U.S. Uh, for those patients that might have high-risk features at the time of uh, surgery. Uh, now, for those patients that have, let's say, positive margins uh, where uh, it was not completely clear, uh, even though you don't have any evidence of disease, uh, but there's a positive margin, then I think it's a discussion um, with your uh, providers on your team. You know, is there some role of kind of outside the box to assess for uh, radiation towards that area where there is a positive margin? Uh, or, you know, should you just be followed with active surveillance? Uh, again, we don't have a lot of data you know, behind this and everything. So I would say that's a really individualized discussion with your providers uh, about the, um, you know, risks and benefits of that, you know, post-operative treatment. Got it. Hey, thanks, Kaylin. And, and, and again, let me know if, uh, if it didn't quite get your question right, or if you have a follow-up question, let us know. Um, from Christy, how often do pancreatic nets reappear after a successful open Whipple procedure? So I think it depends on a couple of different things, you know, for this. Um, uh, one is, you know, what is the size of, of the primary lesion? Uh, second is, you know, what are the number of lymph nodes uh, that, that are involved in the disease? Uh, we, we have shown that there's, uh, you know, those patients that, let's say, already have higher lymph node involvement uh, at the time of surgery tend to have, you know, a higher chance of recurrence. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, I, I think, uh, there are um, uh, also kind of additional prognostic factors, like we mentioned, in terms of 
whether or not a you know, clear surgical margin was uh, obtained, what is the overall um, uh, differentiation of the tumor, what's the grading of the tumor, all of those things you know, add into it. But in, in general, I, I think you know, if you had, let's say, a you know, very small uh, neuroendocrine tumor, well-differentiated, low-grade, uh, then the chance of cure is actually really high. And that's why, you know, we always, uh, even when we're doing initial active surveillance, we're watching things, you know, very closely, uh, because we know that that's potentially a curative intent, you know, setting and everything. Uh, and if we can get a patient to surgery, we will certainly, you know, do that to, you know, hopefully cure them of the disease. Got it. Thank you. Next question from Ruby and a few others. Uh, how long can we expect our poor tumor-filled livers to keep functioning, which I know is kind of a, a, a big, broad or vague question, but is it, you know, you, can you think you can, can tackle that? Yeah. So, so it, I think this, um, you know, uh, relates to what I highlighted a little bit in the beginning in the sense that, um, again, it's not necessarily, um, uh, you know, how much of the liver might be occupied. Uh, but more so in terms of where are the tumors within the liver, because there are certain structures uh, within the liver uh, that are more important, uh, so, such as the uh, portal outflow tract that I mentioned and everything. Uh, but, you know, here, again, it, 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 again, really depends on kind of the grading of the tumor. I've certainly had patients uh, who I've seen in clinic who had a lot of disease at the initial time of uh, diagnosis. Uh, but they had a well-differentiated grade one uh, neuroendocrine tumor uh, of the small intestine or the GI tract. And, and here we, we selectively, uh, you know, uh, underwent liver directed therapy because we wanted to prevent, let's say, long-term complication spots and everything. And those patients have done really well. And, and they've actually been my patients ever since I started here at City of Hope. So we're going on, to, you know, six or seven years already, and they're completely doing fine on initial somatostatin uh, analog uh, therapy. Um, so those, what I always tell patients is that, you know, I, I do want everyone to think positively uh, because I, I do think that does, you know, matter and everything. And these are real patients that we're seeing in the clinic. Uh, so, so what's to say that it, it couldn't be you and everything, uh, you know, following that model. Um, now, the contrast that I will provide is that uh, sometimes, let's say for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, you can have very bulky disease at the very beginning uh, with a lot of uh, liver disease. Uh, I think those patients, you should be uh, a very, very aggressively trying to tackle the disease and preserving that liver function. So oftentimes those patients, we might actually start with oral chemotherapy to try to maximize shrinkage of the tumors uh, to be able to really preserve liver function uh, in a long time and everything. Because if we don't, uh, then you know, maybe in a year or even two years, uh, then the extent of liver disease uh, becomes very problematic and it's oftentimes very hard to control. Got it. Hey, th uh, thanks, Ruby. Hopefully that, uh, that helped. Next question from Karen. Karen says, I have numerous and some very large liver mets. I have been told that I'm inoperable by my specialist, but I've never consulted a surgeon specifically. Would it be worth worth it for me to consult a surgeon to see if they would consider me as a candidate for surgical options? By the way, I'm grade one, well differentiated with small intestine primary, four rounds of PRT and seen some shrinkage and stability. But from day one of diagnosis, have wondered about surgical options to possibly buy more time. Yeah, no, I, I think you absolutely should uh, see a surgeon. And I would say go one step further. I think you should also see a uh, to, to also discuss, you know, the potential role of liver directed therapy. Um, you know, I think uh, inherently here, you know, we're, we're, we're biased. Uh, we, we tend to be a little bit more of a uh, aggressive, you know, surgical center and everything uh, just because, you know, based off of some of our studies, uh, at least from the California Cancer Registry, we've, we've shown that in the select patients uh, that are taken to surgery uh, and with debulking procedures that there's a potential survival benefit. Uh, again, you know, we understand the um, criticisms and we understand the limitations of this kind of research that there's, you know, patient selection involved in retrospective registration, uh, registry uh, studies. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, this is also what we are doing and in terms of what we're practicing in real life. We're selecting for those patients that we see in the clinic that we think can benefit from treatment 
and can potentially improve their survival. We're not offering this all across the board to every single type of patient. We're just really trying to make sure that uh, the patients that we do offer to uh, is really the, uh, the uh, right patients. Uh, I'm not sure if this happened on other people's, but on mine, there was a little blip there. The two people you said consult with the surgeon and a uh, interventional radiologist. I, okay. That's what I thought. Uh, it just cut out for a second on mine. I'm not sure if, if everyone else caught it or not, but just wanted to clarify that. Sure. Thank you. Uh, from Bess, have you, have you seen Cape Tem or other chemotherapy be effective in treating abdominal nets with liver metastases? Um, abdominal nets with liver metastases, uh, for Cape Tem. Yes. So, you know, I, as I mentioned before, I, I think where CAPTEM really has activity are for those patients that have pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so regardless of where the disease has spread from pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, CAPTEM definitely has uh, activity and is probably uh, w- one of the tools that we have that has what's known as the highest response rate, meaning that the highest chance of potentially shrinking the tumor by a significant amount defined as you know, 30% shrinkage overall uh, in, in terms of the tumors. Um, so okay. certainly I, I, I do feel that, you know, CAPTAM, uh, particularly for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, does have activity. I think for some of the other uh, neuroendocrine tumors of the GI tract, which I'm uh, inferring is what you're alluding right. to for, <laughs> for, for the abdomen, uh, you know, it, it's a little bit much harder. So, so for small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors that are, let's say, well differentiated, oftentimes uh, CAPTAM really does not have activity unless it's a very uh, more high grade uh, tumor, so more rapidly uh, dividing uh, type of tumor. So usually I don't go to, you know, CAPTAM for well differentiated uh, grade one uh, neuroendocrine tumors of the small intestine. Got it. Thank you. Uh, from Pam, my husband has had carcinoid now for eight and a half years, lots of different treatments, probably will start on Affinitor this month, but he's lost 15 pounds just this past year. Is this weight loss common? And a few other people are interested in this as well. Yeah, so weight loss um, is something that, you know, we, we, we do see uh, in uh, patients, and I think it's oftentimes a symptom that's hard to tease out, uh, because we have to think about a, a kind of a couple of different things uh, that might be going on. Uh, I think first is, you know, where during the disease course are you, in, in the sense that are you a newly diagnosed patient? Uh, or are you a patient that's already on treatment and have stability of disease? Or are you a patient where, you know, you've been on treatment, but recently uh, your cancer has met resistance to the current treatment uh, and it's starting to grow and become more active? Uh, so that's kind of the first, you know, part of it, uh, because that's important to really kind of gauge what is the potential impact that the cancer might have uh, on uh, weight loss. We certainly know that when tumors are, let's say, more active, uh, then they are essentially competing and taking out nutrients, uh, you know, from the regular cells in the body and everything. And certainly patients can have weight loss in that sense. Um, So once that's determined, uh, then we want to ask, you know, what what kind of treatment are you on? Uh, Because we know that, you know, certain types of treatments might have a higher chance of weight loss uh, compared to other treatments. So let's say if you're on chemotherapy, for example, you, you probably uh, will have a higher chance of having a component of weight loss from the chemotherapy compared to, let's say, if you're a patient that's just getting somatostatin analog therapy or hormonal-based therapy and everything where you're less likely to potentially have a weight loss. Um, so I think you know all these things are things to tease out and everything. And then that will then, you know, kind of come back to your ultimate concerns about weight loss. I would say in general, I'm actually fairly liberal to allow for, you know, some weight loss with the understanding that it could be this combination of disease as well as treatment, especially in the very beginning or, you know, potentially starting uh, a a new treatment. And the hope is that that weight loss will plateau over time uh, and everything. We will get into kind of a a new setting uh, for the specific patient. Got it. Thank you. From Jenny, when a teenager has a net, how likely are they to to have recurring issues once the tumor has been removed? Um, So I I think, again, it it depends on, you know, uh, where is the primary? uh, What's the extent of the disease? If it's really a localized primary, let's say in the small intestine or the appendix, uh, and it was caught early, 
mm -hmm. uh, completely surgically removed, uh, then you know overall those patients might not really have any issues and everything because that, that that's potentially for curative intent and everything. If it's more involved where the disease has already spread, let's say to the liver, uh, if it's coming from the GI tract, uh, then that surgery in a sense might not be curative. It's in a way to kind of reset the clock. And over time, the, the, the patient does have to be continued to be monitored with active surveillance. And if the disease comes back, it has to be treated again. Now, I think the uh, additional component here uh, for a young patient, that young patient should undergo uh, kind of genetics as well as uh, genomics uh, evaluation. Uh, because then what you wanna know for, particularly for a young patient, is that is there some type of you know, alteration or mutation that predisposes you to kind of hereditary conditions mm -hmm. uh, where then there could be other tumors that might pop up uh, later down, uh, down the line while you're monitoring. Hey, Jenny, uh, I mentioned earlier in the program, all the videos that I've done over the years with, uh, with CCF and, and often people, uh, or at least historically have looked at nets as something that predominantly middle-aged and beyond people get. And, and it's not true from what we've seen. And so what's been important to us or the foundation to show stories of people who have been younger. So in the 2018 series that we did, we we featured a couple of videos on people who were younger, one who was in his 30s telling about when he was diagnosed at a young age and one girl who was still a teenager. Um, so those might be interesting to you. I just wanted to make mention of that. But I appreciate your question very much. Next question comes from Louise. Does it matter if I get Lanreotide injections instead of Sandostatin following PRT? Um, so that's also a good question. So I think if you strictly look at the uh, FDA approved uh, label, uh, the FDA approved label is for uh, octreotide or uh, sandosan uh, within the label. Um, but I think at, at the end of the day, if you ask practitioners uh, in terms of what we believe, um, you know, the, the, the question then becomes, you know, do we believe, is there an efficacy difference uh, between lamreotide versus octreotide? And I think if you look back and do the calculations based off of the data, of somastatin analog therapy, uh, what you will find is that these two medications are equivalent in, in terms of efficacy. Um, so, you know, for uh, all sense of purposes, I, I, I don't have any problem giving a patient, uh, you know, while they're going through PRT or as maintenance post PRT, uh, lamreotide compared to uh, octreotide. Got it. Thank you. From Anna, have you had patients with huge weight gain and high blood pressure while on land, reotide, uh, and octreotide? Um, I think, you know, with this question, it, it really, you know, kind of depends on everything. Uh, we know kind of what the potential side effects of octreotide and land reotide are. Uh, it certainly can elevate the blood sugars uh, over time, and that can predispose someone to you know, diabetes, and sometimes as a result of that, there could be, you know, weight gain as a result of that. Uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint, usually these medications sometimes can just decrease the heart rate, particularly on patients that have, you know, cardiac medications. We don't see hypertension or elevation of the blood uh, pressure as much of a common side effect with this medication. So I think, um, again, just like anything else, uh, I wouldn't necessarily very quickly just attribute this to these uh, medications. Uh, I think it's really important to work with your team, work with the endocrinologist, uh, you know, primary care physician, or even a cardiologist to figure out, you know, what are, are there other causes uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, potential for weight gain, uh, as well as other causes for uh, elevation in terms of the uh, blood pressure. Got it. Thank you. Uh, when this next question, we, we kind of have touched on it a little bit today, but Lynn says, has there ever been a survey or a study amongst all these net people to find out what they might have in common that could help to lead to a better understanding of, of how they got this disease? Yeah, so Lynn, I think that that's a great question. Um, I, I think, you know, the overall answer is no, we don't know, um, but th this is an area that's under investigation. You know, I, I know the NIH Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example, is, uh, you know, collecting a lot of everyone's tissue and it has an associated survey that, you know, hopefully have this kind of broad 
overarching uh, way to see whether or not there's some commonalities and everything, you know, and, and, and I hope they're able to help the community to be able to figure this out. Yeah, I'm excited to see the results of, uh, of that. I know some people participating. Uh, from Janice, my cardiac, uh, my cardiac carcinoid diagnosis was made in 2007. I've had colon and liver resection on monthly Santostatin and PRT. Um, recent PET scan revealed new liver, meta- uh, new liver net. Is there a correlation between or with urinary frequency and nets? Um, I don't think there's necessarily a direct, you know, uh, you know, correlation between urinary frequency uh, and uh, nets. Um, you know, there's obviously, as we discussed, you know, potential uh, impacts in terms of bowel frequency, and uh, you know, can you know, bowel frequency sometimes you know trigger you know other things in terms of going to the bathroom, certainly, but you know, specifically just pure urinary frequency uh, in correlation with nets. I, I don't think that that's really. Uh, much of a relationship that we see. Thanks. Okay, from Lee, uh, my husband, 73, diagnosed in 2012, nine, uh, and for nine years uh, after two debulking surgeries has, has been rel- relatively symptom-free. In the last year, though, he's had severe carcinoid episodes where he feels like he'll pass out, sometimes just lies down wherever he is, and episodes are becoming more frequent. Uh, because of the because of the low blood pressure portion of this, the cardiologist took him off blood pressure medications uh, for high blood pressure. He does sanostatin every 28 days. We're thinking it's just not work. Cardiologist says he has to get cancer under control before more blood pressure medications. So we're feeling like he's in a bind. The risk of low blood pressure versus high blood pressure. CT scans show no increase in tumor size or more tumors. So what, what can we recommend that he does at this point with this concern? Yeah, so I, I there's, uh, you know, kind of a, a few things, you know, regarding this case. Um, I, I think the question is, is this like, you know, uh, potential episodes of, uh, you know, carcinoid crisis where mm-hmm. you can essentially, you know, kind of fluctuate uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, blood pressures, uh, you know, very wildly in, in a way, a lot like what you've uh, described. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to see this, right? Like, um, and I would say the management of uh, your tumors, uh, particularly if you have a functional neuroendocrine tumor with uh, excess, you know, hormonal secretion is twofold. You have to control the disease in terms of what is the size of the uh, tumor bulk, but you also have to control the, uh, you know, hormonal release from the disease as well. And sometimes you can have stability uh, while you're actually getting an excess in terms of hormonal release. So what I would say is that it's, it's very important for you to, you know, uh, also have a uh, endocrinologist on board that, that sometimes always helps us to, you know, control that um, functional component of the tumor and the hormonal release and being aggressive by that. Uh, you should certainly, you know, check, you know, have there been, you know, changes uh, if it is indeed related to, you know, carcinoid crisis, any changes in serotonin excess uh, with, uh, you know, uh, 5-HIA, whether it's uh, urine or serum. And everything all over time. And uh, if you're not, and if you do see those changes and you're having more symptoms, then there are, you know, target agents that can, you know, potentially reduce that uh, serotonin uh, excess as well and being very aggressive on that hormonal control. Uh, so I think all these things really go together. Uh, and, and it's not just, you know, oh, you have to do, you know, one thing first before you do the other. You actually want to do everything kind of together. Uh, especially if you're quite symptomatic, to be able to aggressively, uh, you know, control uh, the uh, symptoms of the disease. Got it. Thank you. Folks, we've got about 15 minutes left. We're going to keep plunging forward and get to as many of your questions as we can. The next one comes in from Cindy. How is it possible for a large peanut with, uh, which attached to the stomach and spleen and spread to the liver and have no lymph node involvement are there other ways for the cancer to spread yeah so so that's a good question so for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors as i mentioned sometimes they can be you know very bulky um so there might not be like uh, i would say traditional lymph node involvement but then it can actually invade into the you know surrounding tissues um, and when it does that, it's essentially kind of an extension of the disease, right? And so, 
um, that is something that you know we we tend to see. Um, but then sometimes, kind of in that area of the pancreas, sometimes it's actually even hard to tell between whether or not the mass is actually arising in that pancreas or whether or not there's already extension into kind of this retroperineal lymph node area, which can actually be, you know, very bulky and uh, in a way mimic a mass and everything. Um, so those are the things to kind of, you know, figure out. And uh, again, it's certainly possible uh, to, to, to see that scenario. Um, and again, for pancreatic neurodegenerative tumors, I, I, I would, you know, uh, say, you know, try to be a little bit more aggressive if you're having, uh, you know, significant tumor bowl. Got it. Thank you. Next question comes from Mike, who I think was recently diagnosed or, or going through a diagnosis. He said, uh, I was having unexplained symptoms. My doctor ordered an x-ray first, then a CT scan. The radiologist said there's a 2.2 centimeter mass with spiky edges, fingers, and said carcinoid mass is anticipated. Uh, he's going to Marquette Cancer Center uh, soon for my first appointment, and his sister has had car uh, carcinoid tumor since 2000. And the question is simply, this is such an important question, I think, too, especially for newly diagnosed patients. What can I expect on my first visit? Yeah, so I, I think you can, uh, uh, you know, expect that there could be a lot of discussion, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, in the very beginning, um, when you're diagnosed, uh, we have to try to figure out, you know, what do we want to uh, communicate to you as a patient? And mm -hmm. I would say, uh, every single physician will be different in terms of their uh, strategy and uh, styles. Uh, some might want to, you know, slowly ease you in one step at a time. Uh, others might want to provide kind of a more broader overview and say, now we're going to do this, you know, first and everything. Um, and, and here, I, I think this is where kind of communication is key and also like, you know, potentially what you want to, uh, you know, possibly get out of uh, this uh, diagnosis. Um, I would say if you had a biopsy, that there, there are certainly, uh, you know, several uh, different online tools. I know like, you know, CCF has a tool. Um, and, uh, you know, for us uh, in the Los Angeles community uh, with uh, LACNETs, we have a tool that we developed in terms of uh, Net Vitals, which is a uh, kind of a self-assessment uh, form that you can fill out uh, to help you maybe communicate uh, with your uh, practitioners. And we actually just uh, published this uh, recently in uh, Pancreas. Uh, showing the feasibility of this um, uh, self-assessment tool. Uh, and, uh, you know, patients seem to be very satisfied uh, using this tool to be able to communicate uh, with their practitioners, particularly on that initial visit. Um, so I would say, depending on where you are, um, just be prepared that, that that first initial visit can be very long. It can be overwhelming, uh, but it's okay. Uh, there are resources that are in place to help you uh, to prepare for that visit. And then also just uh, always remember that if you forget everything that, you know, we told you on that first visit, uh, it's really a journey process and all of those, um, uh, understanding about the disease and your questions uh, can be answered over time with follow-up visits, uh, ongoing. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Mike. I appreciate your question. And I'm sorry to hear about this, but I'm, I'm really glad that you found the show. Uh, and again, I'll reiterate, if you weren't here at the beginning, lean on this community. I promise you they will be supportive. Uh, from Christy, why would a doctor order a 24-hour urine test? So a, a doctor will oftentimes uh, order a 24-hour urine test because they're checking for something specific. It's called the 5-HIA, um, uh, which is uh, essentially a uh, byproduct of uh, serotonin. So what they're trying to determine is whether or not your 24-hour urine 5-HIA is elevated or not. If it is elevated, then uh, essentially you could have a what, what's known as a functional neuroendocrine tumor, meaning that your neuroendocrine tumor is secreting excess um, uh, serotonin. And that's important because that, that determines that not only do we have to, again, uh, control the tumor bulk uh, over time, but we also have to control the release of hormones uh, from your tumor to prevent long-term uh, complications. Uh, because sometimes with this excess you know, uh, hormones, it can impact the valves and the heart as well as the lungs over time. So we do need to get you know, good control of that. Thank you. From Bernie, um, are there any foods such as tomatoes that one should avoid, uh, assuming a net patient? 
Yeah, so so this I think also uh, you know goes further from the last question. So I would say in, in general, for the most part, uh, you can actually eat uh, anything, especially if you have a um, a uh, non-functional uh, neuroendocrine tumor, meaning that your neuroendocrine tumor does not secrete any excess hormones, which is a majority of patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, so in those instances, you you, you can really uh, eat uh, almost anything. Now, the caveat is that if you had you know, some recent surgeries or uh, uh, if you have you know, certainly uh, some malabsorption because let's say your, 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 your pancreas uh, is removed and everything, uh, then you might want to avoid maybe you know, very fatty or greasy foods uh, because that might cause some malabsorption uh, diarrhea. Um, for patients that have functional neuroendocrine tumors where they have that excess secretion of serotonin, then there have been you know, certain foods that might trigger uh, the, a, a reaction in terms of you know, flushing or uh, diarrhea. And you know, tomato is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in addition to that, um, you know, uh, I would say aged meats or aged cheeses uh, are, are one of them. And then uh, alcohol as well you know, can potentially be a trigger. And I actually think you know, CCF has like a, uh, uh, I, I know when I first started, that they had uh, someone that put a, a list of these common foods that can actually potentially be, you know, triggers mm -hmm. uh, for carcinoid syndrome. And I found it, you know, very useful when, when I started seven years ago. So I hope mm -hmm. that's in the archive still and everything. And I think, I think, you know, patients should really go to that one and, and everything because it, it's very patient friendly and everything and has a whole list of, you know, potential triggers. And Bernie, we'll try to we'll try to add that into the comment section before we leave. We only have about eight minutes, so uh, if we don't uh, go to the website uh, to try to find that, but also, folks, we have a video, multiple videos uh, on on nutrition, uh, so you can find that under the videos tab as well. You can search for that. Um, so this is another another one of those topics. Pretty much every topic that there could be a video about there, there, there probably is <laughs> from the years I've been working with a uh, CCF. Next question. My chromogranin A was 387 prior to removal of SI nets with metastases depressed. A month after surgery, chromogranin A went to 904. A few weeks later to 720, my oncologist said not to be too concerned. How much does this level impact whether nets are growing or have not shown up on a PET or MRI? Yeah, this is a very common question we get. Um, you know, at least right now, we, we don't necessarily have for most neuroendocrine tumors, uh, particularly outside the functional neuroendocrine tumors, necessarily a good biomarker uh, in, in terms of to track a um, you know tumor. So uh, traditionally, chromogranin A has been used, but the issue with chromogranin A is that oftentimes it's not very specific, meaning that there could be other things that can trigger for fluctuations within the chromogranin A value. Um, so what I would say is that you can certainly track it in the very beginning, uh, but unless you get a, um, a consistent correlation with the chromogranin and your imaging tests over time, uh, then it probably should not be used. And that's really in a rare subset of my patients where their chromogranin A really tracks with the uh, scan and images that we see in terms of uh, disease burden. Um, so I, I agree it's probably, you know, initially... Uh, you know, too early to assess and you need to, you know, follow up with imaging studies and for now really go by the imaging studies uh, and then see whether or not chromogranin A at all, you know, tracks with those imaging studies. And if it doesn't, then I probably would not even check chromogranin A moving forward. Got it. Thank you. From Jennifer, um, I think this is an important question. Why are there so few lung specialists? Uh, yet they say that the tumors are the same. So there's kind of two questions there. I think one, it, it, let's let's tackle kind of the second one first, where this is a point of discussion of a, is a lung net a lung, a lung you know cancer or a, a neuroendocrine tumor? Yeah. So so this is also a complicated question. Uh, you know, for the uh, I would say that. Uh, physicians that are treating uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so, uh, you know, there's kind of two algorithms uh, that, that I think is uh, being played out in the United States. Uh, in the United States, uh, if you have a diagnosis of a lung neuroendocrine tumor, you will either see a, uh, a lung specialist, that, someone who treats all different types of lung cancers, 
uh, from small cell lung cancer to endocarcinoma level one versus neuroendocrine tumors level one, uh, kind of that whole spectrum. Uh, or at some you know, hospitals, you might uh, see a uh, neuroendocrine tumor specialist. So, so at our hospital, I see uh, a majority of our lung neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, and, and the reason why that occurs is that um, you know, the treatments for lung neuroendocrine tumors are very different compared to the treatments that we use of um, uh, other types of lung cancers. Um, so uh, as a neuroendocrine tumor specialist, you know, I, I might uh, have a better sense of all the different treatments that we use for, for neuroendocrine tumors in general and can apply that to lung neuroendocrine tumors and everything. Um, but, you know, I think every single institution is different. You know, like I, I know uh, for some of my colleagues, such as here at, at, in Los Angeles, like Cedar sinai I know they have an amazing, you know, uh, uh, thoracic oncologist who, you know, treats uh, lung neuroendocrine tumors and everything. Um, and they're very well uh, versed in terms of the treatment algorithm. So I think it's just important for you to find a physician that knows how to manage neuroendocrine tumors and not have to worry about where this divide is. Uh, because as long as they have the expertise and they understand how to treat lung neuroendocrine tumors, uh, that's going to be the best person for you uh, in terms of your case. Got it. Thank you. And thanks for your question. And just uh, an FYI, in terms of lung specialist, uh, one of our favorites who is coming back on the show October 5th, I want to say, uh, Dr. Robert Ramirez, formerly of the Nolanets program uh, and currently at Vanderbilt in Nashville, uh, is one of our lung specialists that we feature quite a bit. And again, as I have mentioned uh, previously in the video, we have a video on lung nets specifically. So um, seek that out. I know this is a, a point. We get a lot of questions about this because I know it's a point that is, um, you know, uh, under discussion. Yeah, under I, would debate. Add, <laughs> I, I would add it goes the other way too, right? You know, Dr. Ramirez is an amazing colleague. And, and, you know, when he was, he wasn't just treating lung neuroendocrine tumors, he used his lot knowledge from lung neuroendocrine tumors to yeah. treat all neuroendocrine tumors. So again, th this just shows you that, you know, it's really important not to necessarily just classify into like kind of one different setting, but really just to find that physician that knows how to treat yeah, your specific great point. tumor and everything. So great point. Folks, we got just a few minutes. Let's see if we can get one or two more in. Jessica says, thanks for taking care of my cousin, Martha. Absolutely, Jessica. That's what we're here to do. Uh, da, da. Okay, from KR, I have an HMO. How can I get a second opinion from a specialist? So insurance is always so tough and so, certainly, uh, right. you know, in our area in California, it's also very tough because we have uh, large uh, you know, management HMOs and everything. I think there, there, there's a couple of different options. Uh, one is uh, to talk to your current uh, provider uh, at your HMO and say, you know, <clears throat> would you be willing to have a one-time second opinion consultation uh, with a, a specialist? Uh, uh, at uh, your area or even you know, beyond your area. And oftentimes I think the strategy here is uh, to make sure that uh, you tell the provider that you know, it's let's say for a treatment that their facility might not be able to offer mm -hmm. uh, right now or potentially for a clinical trial because then it's more likely that that provider will say, yes, like I want you to get a, a opinion regarding this. And then when you have that opinion with the specialist, you can get you know, some general questions answered as a way of you know, getting that consultation. Um, if your provider does not uh, or is not willing uh, to uh, support a, uh, another consultation, then you always have the option in terms of uh, you know, self-pay uh, mm -hmm. to, to get that second opinion consultation. And then you should reach out to each of the individual organizations where you're seeking that second opinion consultation to see what that cost is and whether or not they have potentially um, uh, supportive measures if, if you feel that uh, you cannot you know, uh, pay for the cost because we do understand that sometimes it can be you know, very costly. Uh, and then the final way that I think you can get it is that um, there are some providers uh, now, or, or not necessarily some providers, but you know, some companies uh, that have uh, you know, contracted with uh, what's known as second uh, opinion or remote second opinion uh, consultations, where a, a case will be sent 
uh, you know, to the uh, treating physician at an expert site and everything. And we review the case and we provide the recommendations based off of what's been already done by the local provider. So that's a third way that, you know, if the first two options are not viable, that you can at least have a expert, they might not be able to tell you in person, but review your case and provide a written report to you in terms of what their recommendations are. Got it. Thank you very much. And folks, that is our 60 minutes. The show is up. Brian says a great and informative show today. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much, Brian. And all thanks goes to our guest today, Dr. Lee. I appreciate you being back here with us and sharing your knowledge and experience. Thank you so much. Sure. Happy to be with you, Ray, again. Awesome. And thanks. Thanks to you folks at home. As always, we hope uh, this program helped answer some of your questions. I'll reiterate one more time. If you have follow-up questions, reach out to CCF either here on the Facebook page. You can send them a private message or visit them at carsonoid.org. And you can watch the replay as soon as this video is done here in about 30 seconds. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without their support, we couldn't do the show. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching and please join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye now.